Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Rebecca Bosnower with the CDSS Integrated Services Unit. Uh, thank you for joining us today on our integrated practice call for uh, CAMS Technical Assistance. Uh, we have uh, about 42 participants on the line, and we'll start with introductions um, in the room. Um, again, I'm Rebecca Buckmiller. Good afternoon. This is Lisa Witchie with CDFS. Caroline Catan with CDFS. Good afternoon. Janine Lasour, also with CDFS. Hi, this is Leslie Beltran, also with CDFS. Jeffrey Kauf with CDFS. Hi, Rich Connect, the Integrated Services Advisor. Hey, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to get started today by kind of doing a review of some of the frequently asked questions that we've had come into um, <clears throat> both of our inbox and in our chat feature during our previous integrated services calls. And we've kind of categorized them um, into four different questions. Uh, we have a lot of similar questions that come in. So we're trying to uh, take a a stab at or, um, organizing them and such and combining them into one generalized question. So staff are going to take turns um, starting with uh, question number one, which will be Leslie. Okay, so the first one um, is with regard to the topic of how to avoid duplicate CANS assessment when there are multiple providers who are accessing or using the CANS tool. And the related topic of who should complete the CANS when the youth receives services from both child welfare and mental health. So assuring fidelity to ICPM and ensuring that the child and family team is the primary vehicle for a team-based process, counties are encouraged to work together with their system partners, making agreements and utilizing those agreements to identify what works best at the local level. Um, counties are encouraged to work with um, their local partners and agencies in the development of policies and practices that pertain to the administration of the CANs. These policies are meant to be shared by all parties to maintain fidelity to the principles of ICPM and promote accountability between the system partners. System collaboration specific to the administration of CANs involves joint development of procedures that provide ways to avoid duplication and resolve conflicts between the agencies. So this includes agreements with your local FFAs and who, who utilize the CANs tool. Now, the ACL 1881 also provides some helpful examples as to how counties may choose to administer the CANs within the CFC on local needs and practice. The shared management structure at the local levels should support a clear and consistent guide to who should administer or complete the CANs assessment. Now, if there are some counties that would like to um, would like a longer segment on this subject, please indicate so in the chat feature or by emailing the CW, CWS CMS coordination inbox. All right, thank you, Leslie. So that, um, Leslie, is um, kind of referring to asking if you'd like a longer uh, featured segment during one of our calls on the um, sharing of, or not the sharing of CANS, but when there are multiple partners uh, completing the CANS assessment tools. If that's something you're interested in, please let us know, and we will work on developing um, a short training segment on that for a future call. Um, April or Richard or any of our other partners want to add in to the conversation? Oh, I love the answer. It's great. Okay. Nope. Was good for me. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, question two, we're going to talk a little bit about CANS as a screening tool for mental health. Okay. So um, counties may choose to use the CANS assessment as their standard mental health screening tool, um, but it is not a requirement. Um, if a county does choose to use the CANS assessment as their screening tool for mental health, only the emotional behavioral health domain items would be considered for that purpose. Counties must comply with the requirement and expectations to screen uh, children, youth, and non-minor dependents for possible mental health needs um, that, as described in ACL 15-11, um, which simply describes what those requirements are, um, which is that every child, youth, and non-minor dependent that comes into, into the foster care system has to re be screened for mental health needs um, and um, intake and then at least annually thereafter. So if you're using the um, CANS as your screening tool, 
Uh, let me get back here where I was. Um, so as I said, only the um, only the behavioral health um, domain would be used. Where was I? Oops. Sorry. One second. Technical difficulties. Where did just There we go. Sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Um, you have uh, counties must complete all of the items in that domain must be rated. If any of those items are given a rating of a of a one or above, then the child or youth must receive um, must be referred to receive a full clinical assessment from a mental health clinician. If the uh, county MHP, why does my computer keep doing this? If the county MHP uh, completes the mental health um, screens for uh, for the county child welfare agency, um, then the that domain that that completed emotional. Um, behavioral health domain must be shared back to the child welfare agency as a separate matter from completion of the CANS assessment. Um, and that is so that the child welfare agency is able to meet its obligation to document that they've completed the, their, their, uh, the mental health screen, that they have that, that they've met their responsibility in that regard. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, April, Richard, any additional guidance that we want to give counties in using a CAMS as a screening tool? No, just that I think that there's plenty of flexibility within the guidance the state has provided both on the healthcare services and social services side for you to broker local partnership that meets your needs. I don't think there's anything overly prescriptive from either department that would preclude you from work, doing whatever works locally. Okay. All right. Thank you. And if we have any counties on the line that are currently doing that as a practice, if they would might, if they would be interested in sharing their experience during another uh, upcoming call, please let us know through the chat feature or through the email. Um, and we would like to uh, have a talk talk to you about maybe sharing that with the rest of the audience. I, um, this is Caroline again. I think what would be helpful is also is to understand some of those um, ancillary processes that support. The use of the tool um, you know, that, that help you do that help you get there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, moving forward, um, we'll have a quick update on the revised CANS rating sheet. Hello, this is Jeffrey with CDSS. The question is: Can can counties use the rating sheet revised in October 2018 for trainings, or do you need to wait for a formal release by CDSS? The CADS rating sheet has been revised due to a typographical error, which has since been resolved. Counties and providers may use the revised CADS rating sheet, and I have attached both revised copies um, in the handouts provided. Uh, this includes uh, for training purposes, so counties and providers may use those attached revised copies for uh, the rating sheets moving forward and for training purposes. Uh, CDSS has provided the IP CANS rating sheet, again, in both English and Spanish, and CDSS intends to issue an errata to all county letter 18-81, which, again, will provide these rating sheets uh, when they're uh, in the attached. All right, with the corrections. Thank you, Jeff. They're just minor, um, and I think in the trauma domain, there was a very minor um, typographical error that needed to be corrected, but we just want to share with folks that it's okay to go ahead and move forward using the corrected versions and while waiting for CDSS to, to issue formal guidance. Okay, moving on. Um, number four, addressing safety concerns. Um, hello, this is Janine. Um, if a safety concern was identified outside the child and family team process, what is the recommended procedure? So obviously we want to ensure that the safety and health of our youth, of the youth, and we want to um, ensure that we're protecting the privacy and confidentiality. Um, some safety issues may need to be addressed um, 
through provider meetings outside of the CFT. Um, team members should be transparent about their roles and the responsibilities and, and the expectations of their agency um, unless, um, unless otherwise you're constrained by safety concerns. Oh, I'm sorry, safety concerns or court orders. Um, and the youth and family um, preferences should drive that plan. Um, the, and the CAN should be revised to reflect any significant changes, um, and the team definitely needs to be updated around any of those changes um, in case plans related to safety. This is a really challenging scenario, right, but it comes up all the time. It's, it's the, really the artistic part of our social work um, function in child welfare and social services. Um, it really invites uh, a focus on engagement because when engagement is deep and um, trust-based, then the new information relative to safety can be talked about with the caregiver. And um, the, the fears around bringing it up in a child family team construct um, can be ameliorated. You can deal with it. If, if there's a high level of trust. Um, and in some of our um, larger counties that got started earlier with um, you know, CCR work and uh, implementation of teaming, we're, we see a lot of evidence for that. So um, just want to encourage people to trust the process. Um, you know, there are, of course, ethical and legal obligations in, in, in play here, but we just want to um, focus on engagement. It's all about um, the trusting the parent and the parent trusting the professional. Thank you, Richard. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, April or anyone else want to chime in on the safety concern conversation? No, I think Richard covered all the things I was going to say. Oh, okay, fantastic. Uh, Chuck, uh, are, Anders, are you on the line for DHCS? I am. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Right. Uh, I know that, um, do, do you have an update for us? Is there a specific question? Really? I, I wanted to know if there was an update in, in any, do uh, you have any guidance coming out and issues for training purposes um, in regards to CANS or data collection? No, we don't have any additional guidance coming out. I think there are a couple of questions that Jeff sent over. I don't have them in front of me, um, but I could respond to those. I just, I think one of them had to do with training and whether the in-person training is required for MHPs. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, can you speak to that a little bit? Right. Yes, our our... All we're requiring is that the provider be certified by the Parade Foundation to uh, utilize the CANs. And we, we've confirmed with uh, the foundation that while they highly encourage the six hour in person training, it, it isn't um, required to be certified. The, the requirements can be met with the online training tools and completing the exam with a, a you know a passing score. So those counties that um, find it uh, difficult to participate in the in-person training aren't necessarily required to do that, and they should really work with the foundation to determine how best to prepare themselves to be certified to administer the tool. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything else to add to that um, regards to the difference in training between DHCS and CDSS? April, do you have any? Okay. Nope. I appreciate what Chuck had to say. Yes. Thank you, Chuck, for clarifying that. Okay. And then Jeff, Jeff will uh, give you, is going to read out the second question for you very quickly. Uh, are we expected to report 
I think it has to do with the reporting requirements. Yeah. Um, I will speak to the cloud. The EHCF expects uh, this to be able to be um, Is it CDS that is requiring it to be in person training? And lastly, is the data that is expected to be reported to EHCF by 22819? Is there an awareness that you are still in the stage of planning for training? I, I I wasn't able to hear all, all all of that, but I think it it has to do with the requirement that data that counties begin submitting data to the FAF system in February, and uh, whether or not there's any flexibility to that because some counties may not be prepared. Did I paraphrase that correctly? Yeah, you you did. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, we're not the. Uh, I think the short answer is the the February date is is pretty hard and fast. Um, I think we've provided a significant amount of notification to counties regarding the uh, both tools uh, being adopted, um, with the expectation that. Uh, a number of counties would have started implementing the tool um, in July of this calendar year, and many of the other counties would have started implementing the tool in October of this calendar year. And then, um, you know, our normal um, contractual language is when we have uh, changes that require counties to make upgrades to their information technology that we provide uh, 90 days to, um, to for counties to be able to make those changes and and that's what we're doing in this case that we've provided 90 days from the date that we issue uh, that we're issuing the um, we, we haven't yet issued the information notice, but it should be coming out. Or did we issue it? No, we, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused on different efforts. Um, the timeline is based on 90 days from the date the information notice was issued with all of the technical requirements for the uh, uh, IT upgrades. And then another 30 days from, from that, to then start submitting data, meaning that within 90 days from that data, that information notice, the IT systems would be ready to go to start capturing data, and then uh, and then a month after that would be the time that the county would begin to uh, submit data, with the exception again of LA that is delayed till. Um, they, they they were on a on a different time frame. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, this is Lisa Witchy, um, and I just wanted to circle back to the safety uh, concern question that was raised. Um, and I, I really um, appreciate the, the um, responses that um, Janine and uh, Richard shared earlier. Um, I wanted to also add to that the, um, the role of structured decision making and the safety assessment. Um, so when a safety concern is identified, um, whether it's within the, the context of a CFT or during your engagement and assessment and relationship building or investigation phase, wherever it is, um, there, um, the appropriate um, protocol for child welfare is, is to complete a safety assessment through uh, using the structured decision-making tools and if appropriate to um, prepare a comprehensive safety plan if that's possible to maintain the child in the home. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the safety concern can be um, uh, identified within the CANS and that information may be um, use, useful in terms of case planning as well. 
So just wanted to um, emphasize the alignment of the structured decision-making uh, safety assessment tools in that response. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, uh, for time, uh, for sake of time, constraints and sticking to our agenda, we're going to move um, into our care system update for the TDSS um, and the system. Sinultra, are you on the line? I am. Hi. Hi there. Um, Hi. Yeah, so just want to provide an update on where we're at. A lot's transpired, and today is actually a very exciting day for us here because we're scheduled to be done with our development efforts today for our CANS 1.1 iteration. So exciting time. Um, we're gearing up to start our county testing, which would take place Monday through Thursday next week. We'd ask that our um, participating counties, testers, complete a spreadsheet that provides us with their findings of, um, of the testing, just to make sure everything works well. Um, also on that spreadsheet is an opportunity for users to provide some feedback on how they interacted with that feature or function. Um, and what we would do is use that information to inform our next iteration because we've already started thinking about um, what we want to include in the next iteration. So we're looking forward to getting that feedback um, and we're scheduled to get that back next Friday the 18th. Um, also on our plate, um, immediately after all of our testing is concluded and we fix any major issues, we'll, we'll be moving forward with our release to production, and that's scheduled to occur on February 9th. Um, the initial users that that would go out to would be counties that are already using our cans in production right now. Um, the value in having a small set of users initially is for them to determine if there are any issues and also just to make sure that any assessments in the 1.0 version um, convert over correctly to our 1.1 version when it goes out on 2.9. Um, then um, on February 25th, we would roll out the CANS 1.1 version statewide. It's kind of a big bang. Um, wanted to, to mention that it's one big state rollout because it's a little different than our CARES implement, implementation strategy previously, where we did it in waves. It was a phased approach. Um, so just want to highlight the fact that we're just going to go statewide February 25th and we go live with just a few counties on February 9th. So right now what we're doing, since we're really wrapping up 1.1 and trying to get that out, we're also looking at what types of features we want to include in our next version. So um, we intend on trying to finalize that scope by the end of the month. And so we could share more details on that as that gets more shored up. But for now, um, we do have some features that we know will be included. For example, we would have the reassessment feature. And there's also been some discussion about updating our printed version to maybe look more like the actual printed form or paper form that social services has. Um, we want our stakeholders to be familiar with the paper form and, and where to find data on that form. So we don't want to put users in a situation where they have to learn, so to speak. They have to learn how to read our printed form and also kind of learn how to read the DSS form. So we want to try to bridge that gap and make some improvements in that area. Um, there are a few other things on the table, but we're really waiting to, there's a few more things on the table for 2.0, but we would like to wait until we get the feedback from counties on the 18th before we finalize our scope. So that's where we're at with the updates. Any questions? Um, I 
Thanks, Sinatra. Um, with most uh, participants muted, you won't be able to take direct questions, but we do have one um, that's come in. Since we do not have, um, not yet gotten the Remark software, can we talk more about the expectation for data entry without having um, that been released? And this is, uh, see, I think this may have um, more to do on the, the programmatic um, requirement side than the actual CARES automated development side. Um, so the expectation would be that um, CAN's information is just entered directly into the automated system um, until such time as we have the Remark software in place that would um, eliminate any sort of duplication of entry the else cannot if, a, if a CANS is completed um, via paper. So some, some CANS are completed in an automated system, and so it's just directly entered into the CWS CARES uh, CANS system. Um, but otherwise, um, if it's done via paper, it would need to be um, entered. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, do we have any uh, any of our other unmuted presenters on that want to that want to chime in? And also, Sonoltor, can you please, if counties are interested in finding out more, do you have updates on the CARES website or a website that you can give them for more information? I'm sorry. What was the question? There, is there more information avail available about the releases and such on your uh, on the website, the CARES website? Yes, yes, our implementation team has a lot of material related to this release. They're calling it the CARES 2.2 release, I believe, um, because it comes on the tail end of our release efforts, our implementation efforts that are currently underway. So they have um, made some updates to their material to show that this release is coming in about a month or so. Okay, great. And what's that website address again? Um, I believe it's cwds.ca.gov. Okay, we'll send it out to our participants through our uh, chat feature, hopefully by the end of the call. If not, we'll follow up um, as well. So, okay, thank you, Sinultra. Okay, no great. Uh, we are uh, going to move on to the presentation part of our call today. We have San Bernardino County um, who was kind enough to join us today to share a little bit about how their MOU process um, between their Department of Behavioral Health and Child Welfare is working um, to provide some you know, guidance, technical assistance, and ideas to our other county partners. We have um, uh, Dr. Tim Haugen and Jeannie Zapeda uh, will be presenting today, and I just want to give them a very um, big thank you for um, offering to share their county's uh, experience. Thank you. Hi, this is Tim, right. uh, and Jeannie's in the same room with me, which is why she's not showing up there on the list. Okay, fantastic. So we have the, your webinar up, uh, slides up, and you just let us know when you need us to uh, move forward. We'll do that for you. We'll sure. let you take it from it's, here. Just uh, real quick, it, the agenda said something about an MOU. We're not going to be talking at all about an MOU, but we do agree with each other, and we have understanding, okay. so that seems to work well. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, just sort of putting it in context uh, on the first slide, really, Behavioral health, we've been doing this for about nine years. Uh, we really had a good solid structure and process, maybe for six, which if you'd like to talk about those first three, we can we can dialogue, but usually there's fear involved. Um, the We utilize a third party vendor. Uh, I'm not selling their stuff, but I am going to be showing some of their stuff because that's what comes out. For us, the big issue is making sure there's good data collection as well as feedback loops, and so making sure that the reports are available, that they're consistent. And I would say for, for foster youth, probably about 85% of all of our services are provided by a vendor, by a contract agency. And so by having a third-party vendor involved, we're able to have consistency with the way information is presented to, to social workers. And then our plan at this point in time, the incremental rollout is really we're going to have uh, CFS utilizing the CANs from us, and we're going to be providing that information to them. You can go to the next slide. 
Okay, so as we roll out the training, um, the expectation is that our social work staff will be able to um, use the information that we get from DBH, from the CAN scores and the reports, and um, be able to use that with their case planning and case consultations and monitoring of cases, um, case management, and be able to use the CANs in their CFT meetings um, in a productive way. The child welfare supervisor, we're expecting them to use in case conferences and being able to coach social workers in utilizing the CANs effectively um, in their team meetings. So I, I want to give a quick plug for the, the CFT CANs work group that's meeting. Um, someone else put together what there is a knowledge, skills, and values list for social workers and supervisors. And um, Jeannie and I had put this together several months ago. You're going to get a much better product coming out of that other work group than, than this. I think it's, it's pretty good. But this is what we're using at this point in time. You can try the next slide. So one of the things about the CANS is to make sure that it's done initially, right? Uh, it makes sure that it's really something where the information is being communicated consistently right off the bat. And so we have a, a system that could work without the CANS. It's just our assessment system, our healthy homes assessment system, where we have clinicians that are co-located at the CFS offices, and CFS actually controls their schedules for several days a week. Um, and so we have enough uh, assessment slots that they can have a child get a mental health assessment within seven days um, by coming there. And many times that assessment is done there at the office, so it makes it convenient for visit during visits or if the parents need to come in or caregivers need to come into the office, um, they can schedule it at that time. And we've worked it out that, that um, CFS is actually providing us quite a bit of information about the opening of the case so that we can incorporate all of that information into the assessment. On the next slide. So that's what the assessment looks like, and you can see the CANS items are integrated into it. Um, and so this is the assessment that comes back, and they usually get this back within within seven days or so. Next slide. One of the things just to mention, just in case you ever see one of these, is, is um, we have an older scoring system for the trauma items on, our, on ours. And so, uh, at some point, it was converted over from a zero through three, with one, two, and three indicating some level of severity, to a yes or no, because that was a much more consistent thing. When we updated our version just recently in response to DHCS's requirement for us to do stuff, um, it was a long discussion, but we all agreed we wanted to keep what we were doing because it was fairly helpful for us. However, the scoring has to be considered by CFS as a no and a yes. So that's how we present that to them. Next slide. It's just an example of, of what we're telling social workers. Obviously, we, we're trying to teach social workers how to read the CAN. And so here's a way to read that pretty simply. You can see that depression is an issue that needs to be addressed, as well as anger control and affect dysregulation. And we don't want to monitor something about adjustment to trauma. And then the social worker should know that anything that has a two or a three should have some narrative that explains what that is. It's not enough to just say a kid is depressed. You have to describe it. Next slide. So this came about when we want um, social workers to integrate the CANs into their case planning and um, court reports. And so this just kind of gives a little bit about what they, what we're expecting for case planning, um, the harm and danger statements, for it to include the, the twos and threes from the CANs. Next slide. So this is just our quick and dirty way of orienting people to to utilize the CANs within a child and family team, right? So the idea that you focus on actual needs, useful strengths, strengths that you're going to be developing. And this is a way that, that both the DBH staff, uh, our contract providers, and CFS can understand what the purpose of, of pulling that in is. Go to the next one. This is the end, the healthy homes, when you entered into our, our third party system. When you print out the score sheet, you can see that in the background. It's an easy way to sort of read the CANs, but it provides this summary table of needs and strengths, um, which is a way of just prioritizing things. And so in the upper left, you have areas needing action, so that's a, a score of a two. In the upper right, you have areas needing immediate or, and or intensive action, and there's nothing there, but those would be the threes. You've got the useful strengths, 
which are the zeros and the ones, you got the strengths to build, which is the twos and the threes, and then down at the bottom, everything that indicated there was a trauma on would be listed at the bottom. It's a nice short summary way to initiate the conversation about what you want to focus on. Next slide. So <clears throat> in our system, there's really four reports that people get. You just saw a version of the score sheet. We have a comparison report, narrative report, and a frequent practice report. All four of these are ways that we communicate CAN, so CFS. It sort of depends on the child and the situation. Uh, go to the next one. This is a score sheet. It's a straightforward way of communicating things. Uh, it's pretty easy to read in this situation. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see impulsivity, depression, and anxiety all need to be addressed. Also, adjustment to trauma. Uh, we're worried about some non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, so it's just easy to read. So it's a nice report that way. Next slide. This one gives you CAN scores over time, so it's easy to sort of see what's changing. Don't look too much into these actual colors. I made these up uh, a couple years ago and didn't realize how poorly I made this example. Um, but it's a nice, easy way to see things over time. But again, it's, you have to look through a lot of pages to, to read it. Next slide. So the narrative report is really the one that we developed for child and family team meetings. Um, and so the way this works is uh, the cans that are being considered, if it's only one, then it would just be one cans for the initial, or you would use it over time. And you can see sort of in the, in the middle there where you have those intensive or immediate needs, adjustment to trauma hasn't changed over these three implementations. So the top portion, which we call the flag, it's actually, if we put a star in it, it would be Ghana's flag, I found out. Um, but it's an easy way to see what needs to be focused on, adjustment to trauma is in the high risk, as well as emphasizing what was once a need that's now improved, right? Other self-harm during one of these three implementations was problematic and needed to be addressed, and now we're no longer having to address that. Go to the next slide. This is just an explanation for how the narrative gets created. We pull in the twos and threes that are included, and then we give some current history, and also we include all of the strengths to show what needs to be developed and what's useful. Next slide. So this is a report that we tend not to use going into a child and family team, although I do have one agency that prefers that. This is one that gets generated um, almost afterwards, and so it's a little difficult to read there, but you can see uh, on that first page, it has the child and family team action items. And so this would come after the child and family team, potentially putting some action items there. The second page, that's a course of care where you see those dots, just sort of shows the types of services they had. That middle portion, it looks a lot like the narrative report because it is, and then it ends with um, some summary information from the clinician. And that last page is a detailed list of all the services the children have received or the child received. And those are the four reports. If you go to the next slide. And that's what they can use for updating case plans, because all of those include information over time. Our point here is really to emphasize for social workers that the CANs may not reflect a change that's still a positive change, right? Just because you're less depressed, that's a good thing, even if it's still a two. Next slide. That's really sort of the end. Anything you want to add, Chief? Um, I just wanted to add that with the healthy, if you can go back to the healthy homes um, summary, um, that's really helpful for uh, new intakes and um, brand new cases when we get that back for initial case this planning. One? Yeah. So it gives a really good idea of where we can go with the case um, because, you know, in initial, we, we don't have a lot of information on the child or the family. Um, so that's really helpful for the social workers. I feel like I need to put the disclaimer, and we didn't develop this, so we're stealing it from Mark Lardner, uh, who uh, does a great job with stuff, and uh, this seems to be very helpful. That's it for us. Hi, great. So uh, we've had a couple oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. We've had, we have a few questions for you that have come into the chat feature, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, take sure. Um, we, let's see. Um, uh, we have, someone who's asked if we could re repeat the info for slide number 10 uh, as to how the summary info is determined based on the scores. 
Oh, sure, absolutely. So the first row are needs, right? So the first row are needs, the second row is strengths, and the last row has to do with trauma. In the upper left-hand corner, the areas needing action, those are needs with a score of two, because that basically means something should be done to help the child with this issue. The upper right-hand corner where there's actually no items listed, those are threes because they need either immediate and or intensive action. And then in the middle, useful strengths, we've lumped together um, the ones and the zeros, indicating that's a useful strength, the one being useful but not a cornerstone strength, so you need to be careful with that, and the zero being a cornerstone strength. So in, in, intentionally in the dialogue, this is where you get to talk about, okay, we need to address depression and anger control, and the strengths that are being shown for us right now are interpersonal and uh, vocational. So maybe there's some relationship that's going on at work that would be helpful for us to uh, alleviate the depression and deal with the anger control. And then over to the right, under strengths to build, those are the twos and the threes for strengths, which really, these are things that either haven't even been identified or they're just beginning to get nurtured. And so this is the question of, what are the things there that feel like we need to develop those more? So natural support is one of those things that's listed here. You know, clearly they're doing something right at, at um, work and they've got a good relationship ability. So is there someone that they're interacting with at a work setting that we could pull into, their, into the natural support role for them? And then down at the bottom of those things that we have to remember have occurred. Those aren't gonna change on us, um, but, but they need to be taken into consideration. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. So we had a question come in um, sort of related but not um, directed to San Bernardino County um, that I will address. So the question is, are counties required to provide families with copies of the full cans and discuss them at the CFT meetings? Um, so in our policy letter, um, CDSS issued a letter ACL 18-81, and in that letter we did direct that um, children and families should receive a copy of their CANS rating. And the reason for that, um, we had discussions with uh, youth who felt um, very strongly that because the CANS really is a representation of their story, um, it was important to them to really own their story and to have transparency around that. And so we felt that um, uh, providing a copy of the CANS really is um, in alignment with the, the practice that we want to see in the integrated core practice model um, around relationship building and transparency. And so we do require that. Now, um, it also can be very useful to help focus a conversation in, in a CFT by um, further drilling down on those actionable items. And so in addition to providing a full copy, um, some systems may also be able to provide report outs that um, just focus on um, CANS items that have yet to be um, completed or actionable items or you know, any number of um, ways that that we might want to sort and decide to focus a conversation. So um, I don't certainly want to limit the ability to be able to provide different um, variations of reporting, um, but do want to emphasize the importance of transparency with regard to the information that's contained on the CAM. And just to repeat for folks, the letter is ACL 1881. Okay. Um, Moving on, we have a couple other questions for our presenters. Um, how does San Bernardino share or not share the substance abuse portion of that can? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent answer. <laughs> so, so um, this may give me a little bit of trouble with our host. So, the information notice which said that we were not allowed to share that was referencing um, a regulation that doesn't actually apply to the mental health portion. But we are in a position where we share uh, the substance use score. However, we share it carefully. 
In fact, uh, any item on the cans, if the youth is old enough, they have the authority to refuse our ability to share that information with, with CFS. So, um, hey Tim, this is Kim Suderman. Um, Hi Kim. Hey, I was just going to actually check in with Chuck to if you wanted to if you wanted to comment in relation to what Tim just shared because there are the there are mental health plans that are trying to address the follow the the letter the DHCS letter, but also with not under not um, understanding the regs that that since mental health plans are not substance use disorder providers that the the regulation about sharing information isn't applicable based on um, part two so I don't know if you want to comment on that because that's what Tim is referencing right I I I really am I'm not the right person to comment okay. on that. Okay. Um, I, I think that we 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 did issue some guidance in an IN, and then I think we issued some updated uh, some. Uh, I think we issued some amend uh, updates to that as well. But um, I, yeah, I'm just not the right person to respond okay. to that. Well, so I guess I will just say that <laughs> um, that what Tim uh, was referring to for for the rest of the folks is just the the two SUD substance use disorder questions and the mental health plans not being substance use disorder um, uh, entities, but our mental health plan providers that. Um, read part two of, of the WNI code to not apply so they are able to share carefully and then as Tim said there are kids that are 12 and older who can consent on their own behalf um, and decide for themselves what they're willing to share and not share. I think the other issue with consent that people need to remember is that we're providing caregiver information as well. And so we're providing information about whether or not the caregiver needs help with substance abuse uh, or mental health issues, things like that. And so that re does require some system by which you have a release to communicate that back to CFS. Um, in San Bernardino, we actually have a standing order that gives us that authority. So this is Lisa Witchie. I just want to add that um, the two state departments, CDSS and DHCS, did issue a joint policy letter on this topic. Um, that's ACL 18-85. Um, now we do recognize that there are um, those who feel that um, we, we may need to revisit that and our departments are looking at that topic. But for now, our policy guidance does stand. Um, at a local level, if your county and your county council has been able to work through that topic, that's wonderful, um, but right now for um, for the rest of you, um, ACL 18-85 um, does provide guidance from the two state departments, and I apologize, I don't know the DHCS letter number. Great, thank you, Lisa. I think we have a couple more questions. Um, yes, we do have another question um, for uh, Dr. Haugen. Um, could you please explain the process again as to how you refer um, to each other, like via email or fax, um, or do you exchange copies? What, what is the process? I, I don't know that I'm understanding. You said refer to each other. You mean like for the assessment to be done or providing information? Uh, providing we didn't have information. that. Right. Uh, whoever asked that question, if they want to to clarify, in, but I'm assuming it's probably the referral uh, for the CANS assessment. So, so the referral for the CANS assessment is uh, extremely simple because they schedule it. So they just have, we've, we've basically created uh, the screening that CFS uses when they do the initial mental health screening actually includes all the information that we need to open a case uh, in our system. 
and then they provide a packet of information, but they're actually controlling the schedule of my clinicians. And it's at that, it's either at the office or they arrange for my clinicians to go out and meet with the families in the field. Um, and then in terms of sharing information, we generally, it, it seems most helpful to send people PDFs so they can easily file it away as well as communicate with other folks. So we do that, but we're happy to provide a hard copy of things. Eventually, we will provide the data for data upload into CARES, uh, into the CARES system. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, in referring to the CARES system, uh, we did have a question for you um, in regard to that. Down at the bottom. How? Um, Yes, uh, how does San Bernardino intend to meet the reporting requirements by using uh, the third-party software? Do they plan to use the CWS CARES CAN's automated system? So I've, I've been involved in some of that development just sort of as a consultant and, and I've seen what they've said. My understanding is that we, they are still planning on having a data batch upload process. And so our plan is to create basically a data file that uh, Child Family Services can upload in, into the CARE system. The paper scanning option um, would be very difficult for us to do, uh, given, given that our CANS is much broader than the CANS 50 or the integrated CANS. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lisa, okay. this is Kim again. I, uh, the info notice that you were asking about in the previous question where the ACL is uh, for um, CDSS is 1885. The info notice for mental health is 18029. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Thank you. Okay. I... I have a, another question for our presenters. Are caregivers required to sign consents to release their CANS information? Is your practice in uh, San Bernardino? So, so we actually have a standing order that authorizes the communication. Um, yeah, the, care, the caregiver doesn't sign the authorization. The Triple SP, which is our supervising social service practitioners, sign consent. Right, because we have a standing order that gives that authorization, they're in a position to sign those releases for us to communicate with the folks we need to. In terms of getting permission to share caregiver CANS items back to CFS, that's covered by our standing order. Okay, great. Okay, let's see. Um, and can... Uh, we have a question if, uh, Sam, if, you, if our presenters would like to share their practice in their county and then others can chime in as well. It's a little bit broader question. What if a caregiver does not want to share information, i.e. the CANs, with the CFT, with the team? We have a little bit of practice discussion around that. Yeah, so um, if San Bernardino, if you would be able to respond to how you would handle that, and then we'd love to hear from others as well. I think that has to do with the engagement process, right? So being engaged, if you have a parent who's not wanting um, the status of what their needs and strengths are to be part of the process by which they regain authority and their child in their lives, then sharing the CANS data is not the biggest issue. And so I would be focusing on that and working through it. I, I think technically with our standing order, we could share it anyway but I can't fathom that that would be beneficial um, given that you'd have someone who'd be upset with you and even harder to work with. Great, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, any, anyone else, um, if you have anything you wanna add on how you would um, handle a situation like that, um, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Darla? Uh, Darla, you are unmuted. 
Oh, no, never mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I hope we can move on to another question quickly. Um, is it possible to share which tool your agency uses to report out on the CAMS data? Share, I'm sorry, share which tool? What do you mean? Like which vendor? Yeah, or I think that's our question. Sample report? No, I think it's the answer, uh, which yeah. vendor. I'm happy to share whatever you want. So it just if, if whoever that is wants to email me with more specifics about what they want, I'm happy to send them stuff. Okay, fantastic. I will let them know. Sure. This is April. Can I follow up with one of Tim's the questions Tim answered? Absolutely. So um, the slide that had the um, the summary um, that somebody asked earlier that Mark Lardner created. I just wanted to let everybody on the call know that we have a course on the the TCOM training platform where everyone gets certified called Action Planning, and um, he does. The, uh, and Mark actually uh, recorded this course, and he goes through that particular summary. Um, grid along with other aspects of creating action plans that's available right now to anyone who wants to go in and uh, look at it and try to understand how to use the cans in planning better. Yep, that one. And I'll put a plug in for that as well. Mark does a lovely job explaining it. I think the, the tool works much better when it's a dynamic tool that gets created in the meeting. And so it's one yeah. of the difficulties when you're trying to do such things on large scales, you need to sort of provide that information for folks. Um, but when you dialogue about it, it really does come to life. Yep. So yeah, so just look for a course called Action Planning. It's a short course that you can um, follow along with Mark as he explains to you how to do this. Thank you for mentioning that, April. We are um, going to update our CANS uh, webpage on the CDSS website to include a link to that action planning video. Sounds good. And Dr. Hogan, we want to know, uh, we have a question. If you would say I've heard of you, be willing to share a copy of their standing order. Okay, fantastic. Um, if you would, if you don't mind uh, sending that into um, to Jeff, um, who's been well, working with you on the presentation, or to our CWS coordination box, we can send that out to our our members with your permission. Okay. Um. Okay. Right. Oh, looks like we're running a short on time. Um, we appreciate everyone's attendance today. We know it was a little fast and furious. We have a lot of information to share, a lot of great updates coming with CARES. We'll be sending out the web um, address for reminders for um, this, so folks can uh, share out the CARES updates and the go live dates. Also want to let folks know that the call schedule for January 26th, which would be our next call, um, is going to be rescheduled or is going to be canceled and we'll be moving into February for our next call. Um, and again, if you have any um, items that you would like to see featured on a future call, please let us know um, either through the chat feature or through our email inbox and we'll do our best to uh, find presenters and subject matter experts to speak to those um, technical assistance questions in a little more depth. Uh, for that being said, we want to thank San Bernardino uh, very much, our presenters, um, for sharing their time with us and their slides um, and their expertise on how they share the CANS assessment in the county. Yes, and if there's anyone interested right now in being a presenter, please send us an email to our CWS coordination at dss.ca.gov um, email address. Right, and, and as always, any questions that weren't, we weren't able to answer today, we will try to follow up either individually um, or as a, as a group um, during our next call. Hey, thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon.